Okay, good morning. Welcome to the fifth lecture, uh, which is the beginning of capsule number three. In this capsule, we are going to continue further our discussion about fluid mechanics. So, this particular capsule is called as basic fluid mechanics part two. And in this, uh, we will look at two lectures. Today, we discuss uh, some fundamental phenomena in fluid mechanics. We discuss viscous flow. Reynolds number and boundary layers. The bulk of the content for this lecture has come from this student Atul Vishwam, who is a third year undergraduate student from aerospace department. He undertook the same course AE 152 last semester and during the summer he has been helping me in creating content for this course. So, this particular capsule, uh, the first lecture has been created by Atul. So, thanks to Atul for helping me out. Let us look at broadly what is our roadmap for today. We start with an introduction to viscous flow and then we proceed to the consequences of viscosity in the flow which is a laminar and turbulent flow. We then proceed to the concept of boundary layer which follows automatically from a discussion regarding viscous flow. We look at types of boundary layers. There are two basic types as most of you know. We just have a close look at them and finally, we look at flow separation. So, this is the roadmap for uh, today's presentation. Let us start with a very simple experiment and in this experiment, we are going to see the behavior of a few fluids. So, what do we see here? We see four jars filled with four different liquids and in each of them we drop yes. a small ball. So, in the third one again we are going to drop the same ball. So, look the color can be deceptive and the last one is the one in which it will take the maximum time to reach down. Okay, so four jars identical with four liquids. First, we'll drop a marble into the water. But there is a difference in the behavior. So the question is, why is there a difference in the behavior of the same ball in the same jar, just because of the presence of the fluid? Okay, and the reason for that is because some fluids are thick and some fluids are thin. When you drop a ball in the thick fluid, it takes more time to go down. When you drop it in a thin fluid, then it goes much faster. Okay. All right. So, here is another animation which shows two containers in which two fluids are being dropped. We notice that in one container on your left, the light blue colored liquid it flows rapidly and tends to fill the container very quickly. On the other hand, we have this uh, orange colored fluid which takes much more time to occupy the volume of the container. So, which one is thicker? It is obvious that the one which is orange in color is thicker because it is taking more time to fill in. Okay. So, recently we had a very interesting race in which uh, the worldwide hero lost out to Justin Gatlin. But this is uh, just to revive old memories. This is the world record winning race. <laughs> says the speaker, 9.58 seconds. Okay. So, just like we have these runners who run, we also have particles in a fluid that run against a resistance. So, let us see and uh, let us see how viscosity, the property of the fluid helps us. So, essentially what is viscosity? Viscosity is basically a property of a fluid and this property 
manifest itself through a resistance to relative motion okay primarily because of friction okay so if a fluid is thicker it will have a higher viscosity if a fluid is higher viscosity it will have a lower flow rate let's have a look now we measure out equal proportions of our ingredients into our little containers so you have these small containers in the first heat of our race we have water rubbing alcohol and cream water finishes first with a time of 0.233 seconds and rubbing alcohol finishes last with a time of 0.4 seconds in the second heat of our race we're going to be racing olive oil lamp oil and vegetable oil lamp oil finished first with a time of 0.467 and olive oil finished last with a time of 0.633 seconds in the final heat of our race we're going to be racing honey maple syrup corn syrup and dish soap first to cross the finish line is maple syrup with a time of 1.33 seconds followed by the blue dish soap with a time of 4.633 seconds and then slowly but surely the great corn syrup crosses the line with a 19.5 seconds and then finally honey with a 20.767 seconds here are the results of our race. Just like we saw Water the race between the at least line first, you have a race that between the fluids. flow rate and the lowest viscosity. Honey was last to cross the finish line, meaning it has the lowest flow rate and highest viscosity. Okay, so Usain Bolt basically is water. Goes fastest. All right, now a question. Uh, throughout this presentation, when you see this particular symbol, we will ask a question, and I would like you to ponder over this question and answer using the Moodle page. Don't answer here, this is the question to be done. So the question is just like we have viscosity of fluids, gases are also considered to be fluid. So do gases also have viscosity and can you get some information, maybe some videos which shows the viscosity of gases and the effect of the viscosity of gases on the flow. So that is homework. Proceeding further, now it is good to know about viscosity and now let us do some basic calculations about viscosity using the Bernoulli's principle about which we have studied. So to do that basically we just have to go and read the assumptions. Now this was a question in one of in the, in the quiz last time. What are the assumptions under which the Bernoulli's principle is valid? And one of the choices was that the fluid has to be non-viscous. Okay. So does Bernoulli principle apply when the fluid is viscous? So we have to go and check out. Okay. So let us look at first the most fundamental uh, flow which is a flow in a pipe. In this video, we are going to color the flow using a small dye and the speed of the flow is going to increase with time. So you can see, uh, you can see the effect of that. So this is low speed flow at low Reynolds number, which we have not defined so far, but I will define very soon. Slowly the speed of the fluid is increasing. As you can see, this starts as So you can see that the pattern behind, the pattern as you go ahead is changing. Uh, to see these difficult to model much higher speed uh, flow transition flow the pattern changes much more rapidly but you can see there is the oscillatory structure and to some extent there is some uniformity in the structure so yeah but as you increase the speed to a very large value then there is a lot of dissipation of this fluid and you can see there is a very high level of mixing of the dye in the water let us watch it once again from the beginning and the diameter low speed flow hardly any oscillations if they are they are symmetric and they are of low amplitude just with the as the slow flow speed increases these oscillations become higher and higher in amplitude you will start to see these okay. difficult to model the structure is transition flow and now this is actually unsteady flow because it is time varying turbulent flow and what are you seeing? Are these streamlines, streak lines, path lines, or timelines? What are these? You can see how we want these are streamlines. These are streak lines. Correct. Okay. So what we see is that the velocity of the flow in a pipe affects 
the flow pattern. So, when you have very low speed flow, then you have what is called as a laminar flow, which has little or no oscillations. When you have a much higher speed flow, you have a flow called as turbulent flow, where as you saw a lot of mixing takes place and there is a particular speed for a given pipe dimensions beyond which the flow converts itself from laminar to turbulent. Okay. So, what about external flows? This was inside the pipe. So, over an aeroplane wing which does not have any border on the top and the bottom, do we have, do we have a possibility of laminar flow over the wings? So, this is another question on the model. Can we encounter laminar flow in actual airplane wings? If the answer is yes, you have to give proof of that. It could be a video from a reliable source, it could be some kind of a photograph or a paper or a publication, anything that we can depend on. Please remember there are many frivolous things on the internet also. For example, one most common problem that you see is people showing the working of Bernoulli's principle, but actually it is Coanda effect. So, you will see many such videos, you have to be very careful, do not believe anything that blindly some, that, puts, that somebody puts up. Do not believe blindly that somebody puts up on the internet, apply your own logic and justification before you post it, because if you post something which is wrong you are responsible for it. You cannot say I found something on the internet. This is not a clerical exercise where you just give a Google search, you find something, you post it. You have to own up to what you post. Okay. And if there are mistakes, it is ok. We all make mistakes, I make mistakes, so we can rectify our mistakes. So, let us see laminar flow over a wing cross section, but this is inside a wind tunnel. Okay. So, there are two main sources for this particular presentation. They are marked as double star and I think hash and at the end there is a slide which explains what these sources are. So, once I upload this presentation on Moodle, you will have an idea what the sources are. So, you can see here, it is clear visually also that the flow is smoothly going over and below the wing and I do not see too much of disturbance or turbulence behind. Okay. So, visually it seems that the flow is laminar. But remember this is in a wind tunnel, so this is still internal flow. My question was can we have laminar flow on a wing which is exposed to external flow. This is over a cylindrical body. So, here also it is almost perfectly symmetric. This is not a computer simulation, these are actual experimental results, but using dyes for visualization. So, here also we see that it is almost perfectly symmetrical. So, here also we can assume that the flow is absolutely or almost perfectly laminar. Proceeding further, we have a rectangular block and interestingly even here the flow can be laminar. So, the shape of the body alone does not guarantee or insist that the flow will become turbulent or laminar. As we saw over a wing, over a cylinder, over a rectangular block, you can still have laminar flow. So, shape is important, but not very, very important. It is not the only parameter. There are other parameters also which decide about the flow being laminar or otherwise. Yes, Mike. Intentional, this is actually basically an experiment called as a backward facing step. So, <clears throat> what you see is a rectangular block, but intentionally they have created a small gap, because they also want to investigate what happens if you have let us say a water tank over a building, which will have some kind of a overhang or a projection behind. So, it is intentional, they wanted to study in one experiment flow behind a rectangular body and also flow behind a backward facing step. So, that gap is intentional. I think you are talking about this particular gap, okay. this gap, this gap is intentional and notice 
the flow here is flowing you do not see much turbulence still okay. So, by and large the flow is still laminar okay. Now, let us go to the question that we had asked in the class we had this uh, question in the quiz oscillating flat plate here the plate is not oscillating here the plate is fixed, but at a very high angle and still you see that the flow is laminar. So, this is another myth many people have many people think oh if the angle of attack or if the angle at which the body is placed is high the flow will become turbulent not necessary. You can have a very blunt body you can have a body at a very large angle still the flow can be laminar not always true, but can be also true. So, in other words the orientation and the shape of the body alone is not responsible for the flow to become laminar or turbulent. This is a question which I would like you to talk about how can we predict first of all can we predict when would a laminar flow become turbulent and if the answer is yes we can predict then the question is what is the parameter or what is the mechanism with which you can be very sure. So, this was a problem that was being addressed by many fluid mechanics people in the beginning and this person he made some efforts to study these phenomena ok and we will, but then my question is who is this guy. So, if you know the answer I would urge, urge you to raise your hands why why well, let us do the following let us have a proper quiz ok. So, I will give you four choices and I would like you to tell me now of course, it, you all cannot be right all may be wrong there could be a fifth guy who did it and more than one cannot be right because if x did it y did not do it. So, here you can use your elimination skills which you have picked up in your examinations right. So, please tell me if somebody knows raise your hand and obviously after two answers if they are wrong we do not want to go ahead because then you can guess ok. Take a mic please if there is a mic around just tell me what do you think who is this person Osborne Reynolds the answer is wrong this is what I expected this is what I expected people to answer that is why this question because we talk about Reynolds number because we talk about turbulent flow people automatically assume it will be Reynolds oh it is not Reynolds it is a trick question see what is the trick question what does what does it say it says that I have made some efforts to study he does not say I have discovered it he does not say I am the first person but he is the guy who actually did lot of efforts to study it ok. So, let us go on to yeah someone there my name is Rahul so it is Prantal Ludwig Prantal ok Ludwig Prantal that is also a good guess, but it is a wrong answer ok it is a wrong answer because Prantal is a very famous name in fluid mechanics. So, it is a good guess it is an intelligent guess that man was great we call him as the father of aerodynamics. So, he must have done some good job maybe he did this job. So, now we have only two remaining ok we have Arnold Summerfield and we have so now can you guess now you have only 50 50 chance ok. So, you toss yeah so the answer is Stokes ok remember the Navier Stokes equation he is the guy half of it Stokes also remember that is a Stokes theorem also that is what we will study we will study about this particular uh, theorem later on. Right. So, it is uh, George Gabriel Stokes who was the first person to study this, but he could not formulate it properly it was Reynolds who came ahead just like Gatlin has overtaken Bolt ok. So, let us uh, understand Reynolds number basically it is a ratio ratio of two forces and therefore, it is dimensionless the inertial force which resists the motion because of inertia and the viscous force which creates a resistance to the motion ok. So, I would say the other way around inertial force basically uh, tends to follow what is happening and viscous force is opposing. So, the ratio of that is called the Reynolds number and 
there is a critical value of Reynolds number for a particular fluid flow condition. It is different for pipes, it is different for plates, it is different for bodies. We call that as a critical Reynolds number because that helps you decide or identify the point of transition. Okay. So, the transition Reynolds number is called as the critical Reynolds number. So, this is our key, not the shape, not the fluid properties alone, not the angle. It is the Reynolds number of the flow that decides whether the flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. So, there are some typical values. If the flow is internal, it is between 3 to 5000. If the flow is external, it becomes 100 times more, 300,000, 500,000. And it is the best measure to compare two flows, the Reynolds number. And obviously, as the Reynolds number increases, the flow becomes less and less laminar or the laminar nature reduces till you reach a critical Reynolds number after which the flow becomes turbulent, laminar flow stops. So, if you look at a human blood flowing in the veins and the arteries, the Reynolds number is around 100. Why? Because blood is a very viscous vehicle, viscous fluid. So, if the numerator is viscosity and that number is high, the Reynolds number will come down. So, there are people including in our department who are looking at the fluid mechanics of blood flow. In fact, interestingly, we have a PhD student who is an MD in cardiac surgery and he is now a PhD student studying flow of blood through artificial valves. So, if you get time, please visit the aerodynamics laboratory. You will find uh, we have created a small setup where we try to mimic the flow of blood through the heart, especially through the artificial valves. So, there we need these kind of studies. A swimmer operates at around 4 million Reynolds number. Of course, it depends upon the length of the swimmer and the speed of the swimmer also, but this is the approximate value. So, from 100 we go to 4 million. Large ships like this, they operate at Reynolds number of a few millions. So, what is the Reynolds number? First of all, there is a question there. So, can you name this ship? Anybody here who is a fan of ships? What ship is this? Let us go back to Moodle, fine. You can search and put it on Moodle. Now, what would be the Reynolds number of typical aircraft? Between around 6 millions to 10 million typically. 6 to 10 million is the Reynolds number. So, when we talk about uh, aircraft and about aerospace engineering flows, we normally speak in millions. These typical UAVs that you fly, these remote control planes that you fly, what would be the Reynolds number? It would be around 0.3 to 0.5 million. Now, interestingly, there are many students who take up aeromodeling as an activity and they make these remotely controlled planes. Is there anybody in the class who has made remote control planes or is interested in making RC planes? Just raise your hands. Okay. So, in our class we have Saurabh who is actually a very accomplished aero modeler. Okay. So, Saurabh a question addressed to you because of your experience. Um, in your experience of flying remote control planes, you must have attempted to get the aerodynamic characteristics of a particular aerofoil from the wind tunnel data or from the reports. But when you actually fly, did you observe any difference between the reported values of say the maximum lift coefficient against what you actually got? What is your typical experience? We are actually going ahead, we are talking about lift coefficient, we have not discussed it yet, but just wanted to know. So, if I look at lift coefficient, uh, in reality it is slightly less because you have got, uh, your wing is not completely smooth in reality, it has got little notches and things like that and they transit the flow from laminar to turbulent. No, that is not the main reason. Actually, even if I make a perfectly smooth wing, when I make an aero model, 
I will not get the maximum lift coefficient which I get for the same wing when I make a big aircraft. The main reason for that is there is a Reynolds number effect on the aerodynamic characteristics which many students do not know. So, what they do is they pick up data about a particular shape or aerofoil from a from some source, they make an aircraft, they do calculations and then they say we are not getting the performance. And then they assume what you assume that oh it is because of the uh, bad finish etcetera. That is one reason, but I will show you there are other reasons also ok. Let us go ahead. So, let us see there is a critical number of 2900 for a pipe, let us see what happens to this particular flow when you move. So, what we normally do basically is, so this is a flow in a pipe, this is not a computer simulation, this is just a photograph or a sketch ok. So, this is a non viscous flow in a pipe, is it possible to have non viscous flow? Is it possible to have a fluid with no viscosity? That is the reason why I cannot show you a video nor can I show you any, I, of course I can show you a computer simulation in any CFD uh, tool I can put viscosity 0 and get some results, but I chose not to do it. I chose just to show you a sketch. So, this is theoretical flow. You will never see this in real life that you have a pipe and the flow continues along straight lines parallelly. It is only in theory. Okay. What will happen if you have viscosity? Tell me what do you, what do you think will happen? because of viscosity. Yes. If the pipe is circular. It is, it is a circular cross section pipe. So, yeah. there will be a parabolic velocity profile. Okay. Why will it be parabolic? Uh, because of the velocity gradient which is created mm. due to the viscosity like the, the fluid at the edge which is in contact with the surface of the pipe. Top and bottom. Okay will have a smaller velocity mm. as compared to the fluid. So, if I correct you, do you think it will have any velocity or will it be zero velocity? Technically, it is zero that is what we call it, it is a boundary condition. It is a no slip condition, it is no a no slip, slip condition. condition. So, so, so that means essentially we have something like this ok. So, in the center of the pipe the friction is only between the two fluid particles. At the edges you have friction between the fluid particles and the pipe wall. So, you typically get this kind of a variation of velocity ok. Now, the question is, is it laminar or turbulent? Do not go by just the looks, there has to be some logic. So, let us see ok. So, if the flow is laminar, which is what it appears to be, then what will be the Reynolds number? Will it be low or will it be high? It has to be low, ok. It has to be low. So, one can keep on increasing. Now, let us see, let us see a video about viscous flow over a solid surface. This is an experiment. Uh, so, you introduce a small pipe in the flow, you touch the floor and then you release the fluid and you take it up slowly. So, interestingly the fluid which was there at the bottom has remained stationary. This is the proof of what I was suggesting to you that in case you have a flow over in a pipe or in any container, the fluid that touches the surface is at rest. That is why we need a brush to clear off that. The presence, the particle remains ok, the fluid is flowing, but the particle remains. Why is it flowing? Because you can see those things moving, but on the surface it is not moving. That means the surface velocity is 0 ok. So, this is because of friction, the friction between the fluid particles and the surface. Now, let us go to the flat plate. So, you have a camera which is stationary. So, it is Eulerian approach, the camera is stationary and there is an automatic carriage that tows a plate. So, the channel is stationary, the camera is stationary.
but this plate is moving in the fluid plate with sharp edge so the camera is stationary it takes a picture so you can see now the plate velocity is very low and you inject fluorescent dye notice how the structure of the flow field changes as the velocity of the fluid is increasing and hence the reynolds number is increasing now we go to higher reynolds number See the difference in the flow field. So this is the name given to this particular phenomena where you have a very large mass called a turbulent bulge and then you have these vertical structures inside you can see those vortices which are continuously generated and they are vert and they are uh, bursting also. So when, when we study these things in more detail that is when we look at these kind of uh, pictures. Okay. So here is just a snapshot of some uh, CFD calculation, CFD stands for computational fluid dynamics in which we simulate the fluid flow using certain standard equations that uh, can be used to model the flow. So you can see that the fluid is almost stationary, very very low values of Mach numbers on the surface and as we go above and when you go to when you go to the thin region outside you have a very much higher speed flow of 0 0.712 so with this basically you can say that when there is a flow over a flat plate the flow pattern can be divided into two clear cut segments one segment is the red area where the fluid velocity is uniform equal to the free stream velocity of whatever 0 0.172 or 175 and the viscous effects are limited only into a small area below the yellow and green curves lines so that is the only area so if you want to do a very simple analysis let us say you have some equations available with you which are applicable only for inviscid flow and you have a flat plate to be investigated. So what you can do after looking at this picture where one can conclude is if I replace the flat plate with the body of that shape, what shape? The shape below the yellow colored and if I do a non viscous analysis on a body of that shape. I will probably get the same results as on a flat plate with viscosity because the viscous effects are confined only in that small area. So this is called as flow partitioning and this is the contribution of Prantl. Prantl was the person who first observed these boundary layers and he said oh we can divide it into two segments and then live with in viscous calculations in the non boundary layer area. This particular area may appear to be very small, but what is happening inside is very very drastic and dramatic. Okay. So basically viscosity has spoiled the flow field. Yeah. 
the answer is here. So, you have a flow acting over a flat plate and we see that the effect of viscosity is confined only in this small zone which is colored yellow, green and blue where the velocity of the flow is lower than 0.172. So, what is happening here is the free stream Mach number is something like 0.172 or 0.175. So, ahead of the plate there is no problem, the flow is still not sonic, so there will be no uh, effect felt, so the flow will remain at the same Mach number. But when the plate starts, a small area starts getting built up over the plate in which the flow velocities are reducing and finally they reach the red value. So, analysis of a flat plate in viscous flow is equal to analysis of a body of that shape, shape equal to the shape of this yellow green band put in non viscous flow. So, this is what it is. So, this person said why do not you split into two regions and that is called as a boundary layer. The region in which the viscous flows are predominant is boundary layer and the other region is the normal or the non boundary layer. So, this is the contribution by the father of aeronautics Ludwig Prantl and he also gave a definition where does the boundary layer end? The boundary layer ends when the flow stream velocity inside the boundary layer is almost equal to the free stream velocity. He gave a number of 99 percent because if you want to go to 100 percent then you have to really do a lot of calculations. So, that is why he said 99 percent. So, here is a flat plate, here is a steady uniform flow of ambient velocity V and uh, area gets built up which then also changes. So, after some time you can see that the boundary layer thickness increases very rapidly. So, this particular uh, place, this particular thickness is called as the boundary layer and the thickness is called as the boundary layer thickness and notice the boundary layer thickness delta is not constant, it is continuously increasing up to some point and then there is a rapid increase beyond some point. So, the boundary layer thickness does not remain constant as the flow Mach number changes. This is a very interesting image. Here we see a platinum wire on which again we are passing current. So, the water gets reacts with the electrical current and hydrogen is released and these hydrogen bubbles they travel at the speed of the local flow. So, notice that almost at the bottom the bubbles are at almost 0 velocity. It is not exactly 0 because the wire is touching the surface. So, at that touching point there will be some variation, but notice that as you go above the surface. So, this line basically is the locus of the hydrogen bubbles which have been released from the wire and after some time t they are at that point. So, then what is this line? Path line, timeline, streak line, streamline. Yes, take the mic and justify why your answer. X path line. Why is it a path line? Because uh, it shows the part of the particles moving no, across time. Frame. No, no, this is not one particle moving along that line. If it was one particle moving along that line, I would say it is a path line. This is a locus of literally thousands of bubbles which have started from time t equal to 0 from this pipe, from this wire and after some time we have taken a picture. So, what is it? Take a mic. Why is it a streak line? Because the 
that is not true. What is happening, I will repeat here. All along this particular wire, hydrogen bubbles, different bubbles, hundreds of them have been created. Their diameter is very small, so therefore you cannot see the diameter. And at time t equal to 0, we pass a current, bubbles are created. At time t equal to 3 seconds, let us say, we have taken this picture. In those 3 seconds, the front that you see is the locus of the position of the bubbles, all of which left the wire at time t equal to 0. So, what is it? <laughs> you have to understand the four basic concepts. Okay. So, first of all, who is the guy who observed it first? And he observed it, but he could not formulate it. He could not do any calculations to do it. Okay. So, the gentleman on the bottom is the first person to formulate it, to give us a theorem. So, does anybody know? The one on the top, of course, is Ludwig Prandtl. I told you already about him. But who is the person below who studied what Prandtl observed and did a formulation? Yeah, take a mic, please. So, there is a theorem after his name. Take a mic. Uh, he is Von Karman. No, 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 he is not Von Karman. Von Karman came very much late. He is not Von, he is not Von Karman. Anybody else knows? Things of Blasius. 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 We have a Blasius theorem about the boundary layers. Okay. So, here is a full picture of the same thing that we saw earlier. Now, I have just injected the profile. So, you have a laminar boundary layer in the beginning till there is a transition and you have these uh, profiles and that red dot basically is the place at which the velocity becomes 0.99 times V infinity. That is why it is called as delta the thickness. Okay. All right. Now, now I have some interesting things to share with you. This is a photograph of a wind tunnel model for a cargo aircraft. So, a cargo aircraft wing, there was an attempt to do some modifications on the rear side, aircraft aft body drag reduction based on CFD analysis, etc. This is a wind tunnel model. And what do we observe below the wind tunnel model is that at the bottom of the wind tunnel model on the bottom surface, you have these yellow dots okay. and in the close up you can see these are actually clearly visible as projections. So, my question is in this wind tunnel test, why do you think these yellow dots have been inserted? Is it because the wing itself had these projections or is it because there is a need to put them? Okay. So, now if you, have, if you have understood what I have discussed so far, you should be able to think about it. So, let me give you a hint. Number one, these yellow dots are not there in the actual aircraft. They have been inserted forcibly and if you do not put these then the results obtained, the aerodynamic results obtained for this particular wind tunnel test, they will never match with that of the actual aircraft. So, it is intentional. So, question is what are these and why they have been put? Yes. Because of length scale in an actual aircraft, it will be much longer. So, the flow may, may be already turbulent by the time it reaches that point, but in a, a wind tunnel model, it will not be tur turbulent, so you have to trip it. Okay, so that is the right answer. These have been intentionally put because in the large scale aircraft, because of the surface texture or because of the dimension and because of the Reynolds number that is applicable in large scale flow. Remember the full scale aircraft, it will have a different value of rho v mu by L. Okay because it will be at a higher speed. In a wind tunnel, you have much lower speeds compared to the actual aircraft. So, therefore, it is quite possible or it was anticipated by the people who did the experiment that this is a place approximately where the boundary layer will be transitioned to turbulent in the real aircraft. But if we do not put this strip, then the boundary layer will not or may not transit to the, uh, may not 
become turbulent at that point. So it is done intentionally. Okay. One interesting anecdote is that the one of the authors of this paper, M. A. Waziri, was my PhD colleague. I just saw it and I realized that he is the author of this paper. Okay. So I have taken a small image of a paragraph from the paper. And important thing is this: the location of the transition region has essential effects on the drag coefficient. We will study later on about drag coefficients. This location was controlled using trip strips at the wing leading edge and at the nose. The size of the strips was such a small one and figure 4 shows the position of the trips. That is what I showed you ahead. So it is intentional. Why? Because the Reynolds number of the aircraft would be 1.2 million whereas the Reynolds number in the wind tunnel sorry in the wind tunnel 1.2 million and 13 million in the actual aircraft. So it is almost 10 times more. So therefore the flow will not be the same if I do not create. Okay. So what do we learn from here that when you do wind tunnel testing and you want to simulate the real life conditions, you have to create transition at the place where you expect transition in the actual aerodynamic body, otherwise the results will not be matching. Okay. So now sometimes there is a problem. So, my understanding was that if you put a transition strip, the transition will take place and the flow will become turbulent. So, recently we did a study. So, what happens is this is an exa this is one particular um, photograph from another paper in which some studies over airships were done in a wind tunnel. Okay. This is by Wang et al. It is an experimental investigation on a particular airship. So, what they have done is they have put three strips, one right in the nose, one in the middle of the envelope and one near the fins because they want to create transition at these places. So they have figured out that in the actual, this is a scaled model, in the actual airship there will be transition uh, right in the beginning. So therefore, they have put those strips and near the fins the flow gets disturbed anyway. So there is a transition, the flow generally separates and then after doing this they did wind tunnel testing. Okay. I am trying to slightly go ahead, I am sorry I was debating whether to show this or not because I will talk about things like lift coefficient, drag coefficient which I have not taught yet. But I wanted to show you right now the effect of transition. So this is again a picture from there, uh, this is a picture from our paper. You can see I am one of the co-authors of this paper. So what we did is we tried to simulate this particular wind tunnel test numerically. Okay. So the red line that you see is the value of a parameter called drag coefficient for various transition locations specified intentionally by us. So in a numerical exercise or in a computer program which we have written, you can specify transition point. It is not possible in all computer programs especially if you look at commercial programs, you may not be able to do this explicitly. But if you have your own program, you can. Okay. So in this case, Sunil Lakshmipati, the second author, uh, he works in DLR in Germany and uh, there is a code available with them, very powerful code which was used for this study you can specify transition. So what he did is he specified transition physically at 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, etc., etc. and calculated the value of drag coefficient for various transition points. So the red line shows the captured or estimated value of the drag coefficient at various transition locations for the same geometry, same Reynolds number and the dotted lines indicate the value reported by the authors of this paper based on experiment. So what you notice is that there are two results free transition and forced transition. Forced transition means when you put a strip and you create transition that is called as forced transition. Free transition means you do not have any strips there. The flow will automatically become turbulent at some place depending on the critical Reynolds number which is not known. So we observe that if you do not put strips 
the value of the drag coefficient you get is very very small 0 0.007 approximately which we are never able to capture. So, even when we do the CFD analysis with the transition at 0 percent or 100 percent that means fully laminar, fully turbulent or in between nothing happens. Okay. So, we are unable to capture and this made us very much worried because we thought why are we not able to capture it. So, then we said oh because they have done transition. Now, the transition was forced right in the leading edge. Okay. So, therefore, when I have CD, when I have transition somewhere here, I should get the value of CD experimentally matching. Now, my value is almost 0 0.024, but the value that they have got is 0 0.0146. So, we got worried initially because we thought they have put a strip, the flow will become turbulent there and therefore, the transition will be somewhere here. So, when we specify transition also at that point, we should get a match. But you can see there is a huge mismatch between the value that was reported by them and value that we got. So, this got us a bit worried in the beginning and then we realized that the shape of the body is such that there is a favorable pressure gradient in the front portion because the curvature of the body is slowly changing. So, the pressure of the air ambient air at this portion is continuously you know it is more here and less here. So, the air will be pushed behind. So, then what we did is we said okay, let us see where does it match. So, we found that we are able to recover this value when the transition is almost at around 55 percent and that is roughly here. Okay. So, basically what we have seen here is that even if you put a strip, it may not necessarily create transition. Another factor is the pressure gradient. If it is adverse, it will trip very quickly. If it is favorable, it may not. Okay. So, you can see when you have a transition in the beginning the flow is more flow is. Uh, so, as you move transition point behind more and more flow is laminar and then remaining is turbulent. So, therefore, the drag is reduced. When you come to the point where the separation occurs suddenly drag is increasing and behind that the drag is more as more surface is exposed to the separated flow. Okay. So, this is one of the results uh, from our paper in which we put transition at 0.6 uh, of the length and notice we observe here that the flow at around 90 percent shows flow separation which is what they also reported in the literature in the in the paper. So, what have we learned from here basically is that if you put a strip for transition it should be a reasonably disturbing strip just any strip may not help. And secondly, even when you put a disturbance or a strip transition may not occur because of the pressure gradient. So, let us have a look at the real flow field with boundary layer. So, we will just recap now. Now, we are going into practical realities of laminar and turbulent flow. So, here is a real flow field. Beautiful. So, this is the experiment by some students from NIT Suratkal. So, you can see this is a real flow field. Notice that there is a huge zone here where the flow is actually coming back. This is the recirculation zone. When you reduce the angle, then it becomes much smoother. And as you increase the angle, the disturbed area behind the body becomes larger and then at some point you start seeing flow reversing direction. So, basically at this angle the flow from here is leaving the surface. So, this whole area has got separated flow. In other words the aerofoil here is not playing any part in the lift generation. Okay. You bring it down slowly 
and you will see that the flow starts getting slowly better and better. So what are these? These are basically smoke trails. So what are these? Are these path lines, streamlines, streak lines? Think about it. Are they streamlines? Yes, they are streamlines. A streamline is a theoretical concept, you will never see it in real life except in experiments like I did in the tutorial. You will never see a streamline of flow. It is something that you contrive for calculation. It is a theoretical line at which velocity is perpendicular every time. Okay, it coincides with the path line in steady flow, that is a different thing. But streamlines are not something which are normally visible. Okay. So, this is this is the area where the flow is separated. So earlier I showed you viscous, non-viscous or inviscid flow over a plate or a laminar flow over, over the same kind of aerofoil. It was very smooth and joining. Now we see there is a disturbance here. The angle is not very high, but still you have disturbance. This is because of the presence of viscosity. This is because of the Reynolds number. Okay, so this is what is really of concern to us because that area is getting disturbed. So this is the effect of viscous flow. The effect is flow separation. It is a viscous flow phenomena. So if your flow is inviscid, you will never get separation. Okay. And there is a concept of adverse pressure gradient which causes separation or which triggers separation. This is what I showed you in the previous experiment. So if you have a body like this and if you have a flow, you can see that the pressure decreases as you go ahead. That means the pressure is slowly reducing. In other words, if the pressure reduces, there is a tendency of the flow to go. It helps in the flow. Okay. And at the trailing part of the body, the pressure is going to actually increase with length. So that means there is a back pressure which is trying to oppose the flow. Therefore, there is a chance that there will be separation. So the local pressure, it is good, it, if it decreases it is good, but after some distance there is a problem and that causes separation. Okay. So let us see why and how this happens. So because there is momentum in the flow okay, and that this momentum of the flow is actually going against the pressure. So, if the pressure is favorable or the pressure gradient is favorable, it is actually pushing the flow. It is like helping go. But when you are going against the pressure gradient, where the, it is the gradient is positive, then it is actually opposing the flow. So, the momentum of the fluid faces opposition and if the momentum of the fluid is not enough, it will get disturbed. Okay. So, that is a problem. So, let us see what happens now. Okay, what is happening in the separated flow region? You have this reverse flow, which I have already shown you in the video, the area where the flow is coming against. So larger the area of reverse flow, larger is going to be the resistance to the motion. So here is a sketch along a particular, along the length of a shape of a body, we are plotting the boundary layer. So you can notice that at this place, you start facing problems. You can have a situation like this where the flow velocity is positive, but in this area it is negative. That means it is a reverse flow region. And this is what causes separation. So, in a well designed body, in a well designed body, we should avoid creating a shape or a flow structure where the flow is getting reversed because that means the body is not playing. So the best way to avoid reverse flow is to control the pressure gradient. You can do it naturally, you can do it artificially, but you should do it so that if the pressure gradient is too much adverse, you will not be able to, you will not be able to control and the flow will separate. Okay. So now you have some homework which is on the Moodle page. You have to give examples of flow separation and recirculation. You have to locate 
information about why it happens and more important is how do we control. So, I am looking for some uh, information regarding if there is flow separation, what is being suggested to control the flow separation, how do you create favorable pressure gradient in the region where the flow is separating. So, you can think of giving examples of here is a flow it is separated, this is what we do to recapture that flow or avoid the separation. That is your homework that happens on the Moodle page. Second thing is, is there a difference in the way separation mechanisms works in a laminar boundary layer as compared to a turbulent boundary layer, they are not the same. So, what is the difference? That is also something which I am leaving it for you. Okay, because the turbulent boundary layer basically delays the separation. It is very interesting, the turbulent flow leads to higher resistance and higher drag, but the turbulent flow actually pushes the area of separation behind, because it energizes the flow. Okay. So, okay, I think we have had enough of theory. So, now we take a break and go into something more interesting, but still in fluid mechanics. Okay. We will watch how fluid mechanics is used in two sports. One of them is cricket. So, let us just watch a small clip on how the fast bowler. Now, you will see three balls in this particular uh, video clip. Uh, let me put the audio also. But it was uh, difficult going. He's, uh, Circumstances, wonderful average. One of the best players. Certainly not. Lots of excitement and lots of appealing. This is the first Pakistan. ball. But it is slow motion. Big shout here. Huge shout here. Not given by Steve Davis. And that would have been, I think, a thick inside edge. Let's have a look at it. Well, uh, Steve Davis, he's just given the hand signals there for uh, the opposition and the Pakistanis just to calm down a little bit. Now, uh, I'd like to see another look at that. Sit on the back leg and looking for an inside see edge how the here. Ball is curling inside. No inside edge. It's a very good shout to say that's a very, very good LBW shout. Miss Barr and Co. thought it was definitely Umpire Steve Davis from uh, Australia says not out. Go on this time! Oh, the third time lucky! It's an absolute rubber from Junior Khan to get rid of Kumar Sangakala. Oh, what a wonderful spell of bowling from young Junior Khan. Let's see if there's a slow motion. Absolute jack of this one. Oh, there's a hint of a smile from the coach. See how the ball curls oh, inside. Oh, that was an absolute beauty. Okay, so we saw three balls bowled by the bowler, all three of them the batsman could not handle, in the third one obviously the wicket is down. So, this particular phenomena is called as a swing, in which the ball is curling towards one side. So, we have swing as well as reverse swing, both are available. So, let us see what is this phenomena and how it is done. We are looking at the ball from above. It is travelling in this direction. So, one side is it's rough. It is coated with a layer of air that flows round the ball called smooth. the boundary layer. This layer clings to the shiny side and then leaves the ball causing a wake. The boundary layer is tripped by the seam and becomes turbulent on the rough side. This turbulent layer sticks to the ball for longer. The wake puts more pressure on this side of the ball making it swing to the right. So, it swings towards the Scientists have side. discovered that the best swing happens when the ball is new and traveling at 70 miles or 113 kilometers side. per hour. Changing the direction of the seam alters the way the ball will swing. In the 1970s, the great Pakistani captain Imran Khan discovered he could turn this science on its head. Imran found that he could swing the ball in reverse. Reverse swing happens when the ball swings in the opposite direction to conventional swing. The ball is traveling in this direction. 
air is turbulent round both sides of the ball, but when it reaches the seam, it's tripped and becomes even thicker. This thick layer peels away from the ball earlier, putting pressure on this side of the ball. So, in the normal swing bowling, one side is smooth, the other side is rough. Okay? That is why the players keep polishing one side continuously. Okay? They want to keep one side smooth, the other side is getting rough because of playing. This is in the beginning of the innings when there are few overs sent. So then when you have the ball, you throw at a particular angle, you hold the seam and throw it. So the seam is tripping the boundary layer, on one side it is laminar, on the other side it is turbulent and therefore there is a tendency of the ball to move towards the shining side. Now this is reverse swing, this happens when the ball is 60, 70 overs old, it is rough on both sides. So on both sides you have turbulent boundary layer, but because of the seam on one side the boundary layer is tripped early. So therefore that area is going to, so now what will happen is now it will, it will actually swing towards the, the ball, side. So the ball swings to the left, but what no one really understands is why the ball swings more during some matches than others. Rod Marsh. The times it swings most as far as I'm concerned is is when there is this apparent bed of humidity over the pitch, that to me is when the ball really does swing more than other times. Now why this happens, I don't know, but I just know it happens and uh, as long as I can recognise uh, the fact that it is going to happen as a player or as a coach, then uh, I'm quite happy with that. Perhaps the most mysterious of the bowling arts is spin. Australian Shane Warne is a master. This is not swing, this is spin, so that is why we skipped. So the bowlers also use fluid mechanics to give the ball a variation. Now I want to show one of the best starts between India and Pakistan in which our bowler used swing balling to take three wickets in three balls, okay, the first three balls. This is the first ball. In India are off the mark. All the three deliveries extremely good from Patan. Just marginally shot on the couple of occasions, not making the batsman play. But this was a minor adjustment in length, great deviations. The These are good conditions to put the outstanding, forcing the batsman to play ahead. And a good low catch by Rahul Jab with the slipper, the yes, captain. The early breakthrough is what India wanted. That the cloud cover has enveloped Second the National Stadium Karachi. Well, close enough to call. I think it is close enough to call and he's gone. What a good delivery. Look at the speed of the ball. The ball is a good line, swing, direction. The the and the result was a perfect turn uh, for over. the left armor. The Indians would have realized from the last game. But Eunice Khan was a good candidate for leg before. He was out See, how before the the in the 190s. And here, first delivery. What a great one. Good delivery, pitching in line, just a bit of swing. And wickets with consecutive deliveries. India. Look at that field. We got rid of Eunice Khan with a lovely indica. What will this ball be? Look at the ball. Shiny outside. Oh, is going to hit me. Second Indian to take it. What a delivery. He's become a star again. I, I, I don't think there is a slow motion after that. Okay. Let's move to another game called as a golf. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That is why they rub. They rub the ball because they want to make it smooth on one side. That is the reason why they rub the ball. Okay. Golf is another game where they use fluid mechanics by dimpling the ball. So when you dimple the ball, you ensure that the flow is turbulent. And when the flow is turbulent, then the boundary layer is more stable. The flow of separation is delayed. And because of that, the length to which this particular ball will go is nearly twice compared to a smooth golf ball. Okay. So let us see. 
why we have these dimples and now the, the diameter of these dimples their depth is also very carefully designed. It should be sufficiently deep so that it causes disturbance but not separation and the number of dimples and the dia of the dimples and the shapes are also carefully monitored as you can see in this nice video. This shows you the working of the dimples on the golf ball. It's the golf ball so unique is not just its small shape but hundreds of small impressions or dimples on its surface. A golf ball has dimples to reduce wind resistance or aerodynamic drag. When you reduce it, you can make golf balls go a lot farther. Adding dimples to the ball changes how the air flows over it. As the air travels over one of the dimples, a tiny pocket of turbulence or air disturbance is created on the surface. It tries to go in and then has a region where it's actually detached, but then by the time you get to the next dimple in the ball, it reattaches itself. And in the process of that detachment, reattachment, that's what creates the turbulence. Instead of impeding the flight of the ball, these tiny pockets of turbulence allow the closer layer of air to travel tighter around it. A more attached airflow creates a smaller rake, and thus a smaller low pressure zone which means less drag. Even this slight change can make a big difference. A golf ball with, with dimples will go almost twice as far as a golf ball without. While dimple sizes, shapes, and effects may differ, they remain a crucial aspect of all golf ball designs. Okay, they also use curling of the flow. So, if they have to go past an obstacle, they actually impart spin to the ball, just like we saw in the Quanda effect earlier. Okay, so summing up, what have we learned till now? What have we learned? <coughs> Number one, we have learned that there is something called as a viscous flow, which is a natural property of any flow. In real life, all flows are viscous, but the viscosity may vary. As we saw in the beginning, the race among various fluid particles, we saw that honey has the highest viscosity, so it took the maximum time, more than 20 seconds to come, as against 0.4 seconds for water. Okay. So that is because the viscosity of honey is far, far more than water and color of the fluid does not matter, it is the viscosity that really tells you how much friction will be created. So viscous flow is reality. There are two basic types of flow, laminar and turbulent depending on the value of the Reynolds number of the flow. Laminar flow is the one where the drag is less because there is less mixing between the layers. It is a very smooth flow, but laminar flow can be maintained only when the flow Reynolds number is below a critical number. And also in the next class we will study about flow separation in more detail. We will see about the stability of the laminar and turbulent flow. So laminar flow has less drag but it is more unstable. Turbulent flow on the other hand is the one where there is a mixing happening between the various layers. Turbulent flow will have more drag than laminar flow but the turbulent flow as you saw in the golf ball, the turbulent flow actually reduces the wake behind the body and hence it reduces the adverse pressure and hence it gives you lower drag. Plus it does not allow the boundary layer to separate easily. So turbulent, turbulent flow is more stable, separation is less in turbulent flow than in laminar flow. So between these two we have transition, transition does not depend upon the shape of the body, it does not depend on the angle at which the body is placed. It depends on the property of the fluid called as viscosity. So, and the parameter called as the Reynolds number, which is the ratio of the two forces, inertial and viscous forces. When the Reynolds number is beyond a number called as a critical Reynolds number, which depends on temperature, viscosity, surface roughness, many other things which we have not discussed so far. But the moment you have a transition, the flow will become turbulent. Then Reynolds number is the parameter which is used to identify the transition location. We also saw that there is a small area near the surface of a body called as a boundary layer 
in which the viscous effects of the boundary layer are limited. So therefore, if you have a non-viscous calculation procedure, you can calculate the forces acting on the body by assuming the body of a shape equal to the body plus boundary layer, a new body which is body plus boundary layer. If you, if you investigate non-viscous flow on that, you can get pretty much most of the values, okay. except you will not get drag because drag depends on the viscosity a lot. So the boundary layer is the small area which is uh, where the viscous effects are confined. The boundary layer become, is 0 at the beginning of the body, it slowly increases and then when there is a transition, the boundary layer becomes very thick. So a laminar boundary layer is thinner and a turbulent boundary layer is normally thicker. And when you have a separation, when you have a transition, when you have a transition from laminar to turbulent, there is a tendency in the end that you might reach a place where there is a adverse pressure gradient or where the flow velocity is reversed. So that area is called as separation. It has to be minimized by careful design because when you have separation it means the fluid particles there are not taking part in generating the forces except the drag force. So the area of separation has to be kept as low as possible under the operating conditions. And now are there any questions before we wind up for the day? Do you have any questions based on what we have seen so far? Yes? Sir, in the video which you showed of the headrest, so the ball was new, so it must be smooth from both the sides. Yes, that is true, but by holding the seam in a particular location, when you throw it, the seam will still trip the boundary layer. Okay, so in a brand new ball also when both sides are smooth, you can still create swing because you can use the seam position to trip and that will create uh, a difference in both the sides. But that becomes more. So what people do is when you, when you um, start playing, okay the ball gets uh, disturbed from both sides. So intentionally one side is chosen by the bowler and they keep spitting on it, they keep rubbing it because they want to improve. Because the seam of the ball gets also broken and disturbed with time. So the, ten, the so you are right, swing will take place even in a brand new ball. In the first ball of the inning also it can be swung. Okay, In the recent match between India and Pakistan you must have seen Rohit Sharma. He was not able to face Muhammad Amir's bowling because it was singing right in the first. So the third ball he was out or the second ball he was out. So it was a beautiful uh, swing bowling. So swing can take place even because of the seam. Yes, any more questions? Yes, take the mic please. So in that example of uh, aeroplane wing where we have the trip strip on the wing at the last of the wing. Yeah. So you said that we intentionally made these strips because we want turbulence flow after that uh, strip. So my question is why we want turbulence uh, flow after that? Strip? Okay. See, when you do wind tunnel testing or any numerical analysis, you would like to capture the flow phenomena as it exists on the actual aircraft. Correct? That is the purpose of wind tunnel testing to predict the flow parameters of the actual aircraft. So that means the conditions to which the actual flow is subjected we want to replicate in the laboratory. So the actual wing is going to fly at a very high Mach number, let us say 0.9. So wind tunnel will have only Mach number of nearly 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Okay. The actual wing will be very large in size, you can have only a scaled model. So we know that if we want to get the correct flow characteristics, we must maintain the Mach number and Reynolds number. Mach number we cannot maintain. So we will say, okay, let us try to keep the same Reynolds number. So your model is, let us say, 10 times smaller. So Reynolds number is 1 tenth already. Let us say your speed is 10 times less. So you are 100 times lower Reynolds number. 
So, if I do not do anything, I just put the scaled model of the aircraft in the wind tunnel, I will operate at a Reynolds number of approximately 100 times lower than actual. If the, if the ratio of Mach numbers and the size is 1 tenth, correct. So, therefore, we know that as Reynolds number changes or I should say that Reynolds number is a very important parameter affecting the flow behavior. So, in an actual aircraft because of large Reynolds number it was 13 million in this example. When you have 13 million Reynolds number then in the actual aircraft the flow is going to become turbulent at 10 percent of the wing leading edge. This is an observation. But when I put a model in the wind tunnel because the Reynolds number is 100 times less, it may not trip at 10 percent, it may trip at 30 percent. So, then I will not have the correct value of drag. So, what I do is I intentionally create transition at the place where it will be on the big aircraft. So, that at least my experimental data is not wrong. That is the purpose why we use transition strips. But as I showed you, it does not always work. As I showed you in the next example, they put a transition strip, but the flow did not separate, the flow did not become turbulent there. The flow became turbulent only at around 55 percent. Yes. Uh, sir, generally there is experiment and test can be carried out on the model. Yes. Which is made first and the real aircraft will be made at the end of this exercise. So, how do we have a prior intimation that where it should trip in the actual aircraft? Very good question. We do not have. So, what we do is in most practical aircraft, the transition will take place right in the leading edge. We assume, we assume that the wing will be in fully turbulent flow. So, what we do is we put a strip in the leading edge. So, there is no chance of the boundary layer being laminar. Okay. So, in typical aircraft design exercises, the fuselage will have a laminar flow only about 5 percent, never 5 or 10 percent. There are some exceptions, there are some aircraft where the shaping of the fuselage is such that the transition starts at 10, 15 percent, but generally for any, because there will be imperfections in fabrication, there will be uh, maybe there is a, there is some rivets which are protruding out. So, therefore, we assume that right in the front there will be transition to turbulent. Okay. For the wing, a very well designed wing 10 percent, 15 percent we could think it to be laminar. After that you will have uh, items on the wing which will protrude, maybe there is a, a de-icing pad or there is some projection on the top, maybe there are slats which have a small edge. So, the flow will become turbulent. Okay. So, therefore, in normal wind tunnel testing, now here this testing was done after the aircraft was designed because here they are trying to change the rear of the wing to reduce the base drag. So, therefore, they have they have an idea what is the location of the probable location of the boundary layer uh, transition and that is what they are simulating. So, what you say is right in an actual aircraft when we design it normally we assume 100 percent transition. Okay. What is uh, your name? My name is Srinath. Yes. Uh, the laminar uh, flow changes to turbulent flow when the Reynolds number crosses critical Reynolds number. Not only that, not only that, it changes to turbulent flow at a critical Reynolds number if everything else is remaining same. But uh, I can do it earlier by doing some nasty things. Okay. Uh, what is the main factor which uh, influences this? I mean, uh, what is the factor which uh, converts laminar flow to turbulent flow. The Reynolds number because basically the transition takes place because of the interplay between the inertial and the viscous forces where the viscous forces become predominant. Uh, for viscous forces to become predominant is, this ne is it necessary for the ratio to be uh, in millions or lakhs? No, no, not necessary. For example, in pipe it is 2900. It is not, as I said, the critical Reynolds number is not, uh, it, it, cannot, it should not be only in millions or in some range. It varies. See, I have not talked about things like temperature, surface roughness, they also affect. Okay. So, predicting transition is a very 
big challenge in fluid mechanics even today. It is very difficult to predict transition on any general body. Okay, so many people are able to only do so. For example, there are some models. There is one model called as a E power n uh, transition prediction model. So these are all empirical models. They they are based on data or studies in the past about flows where transition has been observed. So it's like mix and match kind of a thing. So even today, there is no reliable method or code available which will say. Okay, if this is the flow, if this is the geometry, if this is the property, 100% transition will take place here. It's not available. Okay, but for for simple things like just a pipe, Reynolds observed that when this number goes beyond 2900 or some value, the flow becomes turbulent. But that is only for pipe flow with a simple fluid, a uniform steady flow. Okay, but for a really complicated shape, it's difficult to actually predict the transition point. 